Welcome to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of this week's precious metals news. It's Friday, August 24th. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. Gold enjoyed a bit of a rally this week, briefly pushing back above the $1,200 mark, but lost ground late in the week. This morning, we're back below $1,200. It's the same old story, dollar strength. The dollar index moved back above 95 late in the week after losing some ground earlier when President Trump once again took aim at the Fed's interest rate policies. I'll get a little bit deeper into that in just a moment. Despite unbridled optimism in the markets unleashed last week by news that China was coming to the table, the trade war continued to heat up this week. The United States and China took the current trade dispute to yet another new level, Both countries placed 25% tariffs on approximately $16 billion worth of goods this week. I will once again emphasize the same thing I emphasize every time I talk about this crazy trade war. Whenever you hear tariff, think tax. So what we have is a 25% tax on $16 billion of goods. And somehow this is going to make us more prosperous? So there was some unsettling economic news this week. Existing home sales were down for the fourth straight month. Analysts were expecting a rebound after last month's disappointing numbers. This is the first time in five years we've seen existing home sales fall four consecutive months. This brings us to the Federal Reserve. The Fed released the minutes from its most recent FOMC meeting. There weren't really any surprises. We're still apparently on track for another rate hike in September and then again in December. But there was some dovish sentiment buried in the minutes. The committee mentioned the aforementioned weakness in the housing sector. As Peter Schiff mentioned in his podcast this week, if a Federal Reserve is really concerned about weakness in the housing market, why would it keep raising interest rates? Because part of the problem for the housing market is that rising interest rates are making home ownership more expensive. In fact, this is probably one of the most obvious impacts of rising rates on the economy. Higher interest rates make it more expensive to buy homes, not just in real terms, but also when you consider monthly mortgage payments. If rates keep going up, we can look for even more sluggishness in the real estate market. But it's not just housing that is getting more expensive as rates rise. When you have an economy built on debt, pretty much everything gets more expensive cars, student loans, even everyday purchases, because the data shows a lot of Americans are supporting their addiction to spending with their credit cards. This is the essence of the business cycle. Everybody lives it up when rates are low, and then when the central bank suddenly starts watering down the punch, the partygoers throw a fit. The bubbles, the low rates blew up, start to deflate, and eventually something pops. We've seen it before. We had a dot-com bubble, it popped. We had a housing bubble. It popped. Now we have what some people have called an everything bubble. If the Fed keeps pushing up rates, something is going to pop. FOMC members also expressed concern about this trade war and indicated they could slow the pace of hiking if it continues to heat up. Like I said, it's most certainly still heating up. So here's the $64,000 question. How long will the Fed keep raising rates? I don't think it can last much longer. There's already talk about being close to the neutral rate. That basically means normal. We're only at 2%. That ain't normal. But I don't think they can go much further without wrecking the economy. It's that business cycle I just talked about. Peters made this same point, and that doesn't bode well for the dollar. Peter said the main reason that everybody believes the U.S. dollar is going to continue to strengthen is because they believe the Fed is going to keep raising rates and shrinking its balance sheet. Now, as long as the Fed keeps up this pretense, it will continue to put pressure on emerging markets and it will continue to put pressure on the housing markets. So ultimately, the Federal Reserve is going to have to give. The markets are going to have to start anticipating the end of the cycle. Because even though the Fed is still talking about removing monetary accommodation, there's really not much left that they can remove without the whole thing toppling down. Now, this would certainly please Donald Trump. 
I mean an end to the rate hiking, not the economy toppling down. Actually, that's his worst nightmare. Trump continues to take credit for the bull market despite the fact that the vast majority of it happened before he ever took office. Of course, as a candidate, Trump called the market a big, fat, ugly bubble. He was right then, but as the saying goes, he's forgotten where he's come from. Now that it's his big, fat, ugly bubble, it's no longer ugly, it's no longer fat. Heck, I guess it's not even a bubble anymore. It's just a record-setting bull market that he wants to claim credit for. Now, at some level, I think the president must know that if the Fed keeps hiking, the charade will be exposed for what it is. This week, he once again took aim at Fed Chair Jerome Powell. During a Reuters interview, Trump said the Fed needs to do more to help him boost the economy. Quote, I'm not thrilled with his raising of interest rates. No, I'm not thrilled, Trump said. Well, I guess he isn't. We'll see if the rate hiking lasts. Again, it's the $64,000 question. Will the Fed back off or will it let things tank? I've talked about peak gold several times on this podcast. That's the point where the amount of gold mined out of the earth will begin to shrink every year. This week, we got another report signaling that if we aren't at or near peak gold, we're at least in for a prolonged period of declining mine output. Analysts project gold output in Australia, the world's number two gold producer, along with several other key countries, could slump to, quote, generational lows in the midterm. Bullion production has grown for the last nine years. It hit an all-time high in 2017, and gold output has generally increased each year since the 1970s. But there are signs that output is beginning to plateau. While world gold output did hit a record in 2017, it only grew by 5.7 tons, according to the World Gold Council. That represents the smallest increase since 2008. According to a report by S&P Global Market Intelligence, while gold production will increase marginally over the next three years, there are troubling signs on the horizon. In its gold pipeline report, S&P forecast a 9% fall in Australian gold production in 2020 and expects the country's bullion output to reach a generational low of 6.8 million ounces by 2022. That represents a 33% drop in just three years. The report also projects a 1.9 million ounce decline in Peruvian gold output by 2022. As Mining.com reports, this as no new gold mines have begun production in the country since the start of 2017, and only one project seems likely to go online in the next five years. Peru ranks sixth in the world in overall gold production. We've also reported on South Africa's woes. Once the world's leading gold producer, that country could run out of gold within four decades. Analysts have said that at current production levels, South Africa has only 39 years of accessible gold reserves remaining. Now, Canada and some West African countries may see production increases that will help mitigate some of these declines. But looking long term, the S&P report said the global outlook for gold production does not look positive beyond 2022. When looking at the gold market, you should never lose sight of fundamentals, supply and demand. The gold industry may well be entering a long-term and possibly irreversible period of less available gold. As mining companies find it more difficult to pull gold out of the earth, it will mean less gold for refiners to produce for the consumer market. Remember, gold gets its value from its scarcity, and it seems to be becoming more scarce. Now, speaking of value, in a note to clients, Wells Fargo Investment Institute highlighted silver as the best investment choice at the moment. Quote, at the top of our commodity buy list are metals, especially precious metals. Silver looks to be the best buy, the note said. Silver is down and has good fundamental backdrop for long-term investors. Accumulating silver in the $13 to $14 range looks like a good deal in our view, the note went on to say. As I've been saying, gold and silver are both on sale right now. To learn more about investment opportunities in precious metals, talk to one of our Shift Gold Precious Metal Specialists today. Just call 1-888-GOLD-160. Well, that's a gold wrap for this week. You can get more details on all of these stories and more, and keep up with the latest precious metals news and analysis throughout the week at shiftgold.com news. If you haven't done it already, you can subscribe to the Friday Gold Wrap over at iTunes for free. We have a link on our show notes page. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you again next week.